What is up everybody, Dan and the Fireman here. We're gonna be going over Snow Cat's crash a couple years ago. Let's listen to what he says for his own after action report. All right, let's pay attention to the car in front of me. I'm pacing him. We're doing the exact same speed for a good block here. And you'll see once he passes this intersection in front of me, he starts to slow down. So we'll let him get there first, still pacing him. Nothing, uh, nothing wrong here. And after this light, he slows down quite a bit. So he's lost, something's happening. And so I'm like, well, might as well go around him. What the? <laughs> and here it is, guys. There's the crash. Simple as that. Me and one vehicle. So now that we know what his thought process was, especially after the crash, I mean, obviously he's not going to make this video in his voiceover during the crash. So this was after the crash. This is him trying to rationalize what happened, how it happened, and how he could probably prevent this incident for himself. So now that we listen to what Snowcat had to say uh, for his own version of an after action report. Now this is what I do on the channel. I watch other people's crashes and I do an after action report with information that only I can see. So this is a really good insight of what's happening uh, after the crash and his own thought process. So if you guys are actually in involved in any type of crash or close call, I'm actually starting a new podcast on the After the Ride channel. It's called After the Crash. And I'd love to interview you guys to get your own opinion, your own view of what happened. And it would be a fun discussion. So Snowcat, if you're watching this, uh, let's go ahead and get together and figure out what's going on. So anyways, uh, what we're going to be doing here is we're not going to focus too much on you know, the speed and the crazy abilities because nothing here was out of the ordinary. He was going uh, his speed limit. He was doing what he needed to do. And the only thing he decided to do was to uh, go around a vehicle. And I like how he talked about that and how the person slowed down and obviously is lost. So we're going to be focused on basically the psychology of the driver, why they're slowing down, and then how we can kind of like, you know, mitigate some of the risks. Remember, when we have, you know, a bunch of different factors come into play, you know, the sun in our eyes, you know, a person being lost and, you know, all these different things, if they all come together at once, it can involve a crash, okay? If they're all separated, like right now, everything's separated, the sun in the eyes, uh, it, it's not going to involve a crash right now. That's just one factor, but combine them all together, you have a really bad recipe for disaster, basically. So we're going to move forward to this portion. And he's talking about, you know, he's pacing the vehicle, pacing the vehicle. That's exactly what you guys want to do when it comes to having a space cushion. So if you are starting to get closer and closer and closer to that vehicle, you're either speeding up or that person's slowing down. Either way, your space cushion is getting diminished. Therefore, your total stopping distance is going to be diminished. You have to stop within whatever, you know, between you and the vehicle. So it's your best bet to pace the vehicle. And that's exactly what he was doing. There was a misstep after the light. So it seems like the person uh, got a little lost and and something happened to that so we're gonna go ahead and look into this and figure out why so you notice how we gotten closer and closer to this vehicle this person's probably looking at their phone this person's trying to find directions they might be new to the area all these different things can play a huge role in whether or not they're gonna slam the brakes on you or do some type of erratic behavior I talk about in all my videos is that if somebody is slowing down if there's brake lights if there is any indication that they are not going the the speed limit or going the speed that they originally were that means they're making a decision it's all based on that whole you know let me turn down the audio so i can find you know the house number you really don't need to turn down the audio to look and see something it's just that there's too much inputs too much stuff happening that you have to start removing some things here and there in order to complete a task and that's going to be part of that driver psychology i was talking about is that they're going to be slowing down because they're distracted by their phone or they're distracted by where they're supposed to go they're looking at something signs, they're looking at all these different things, and they need to slow down in order for them to have these opportunities to look around without passing the area that they're supposed to be in. So if we can see that, if we can recognize that when people are driving, then we should understand now why are they doing that? Because they're trying to make a decision. And typically when people make decisions on the road, it's erratic, it's quick, and we don't have a lot of time to react. So that's what he says here is that he's probably lost. These people are probably lost. And he's like, you know, what? I'm going to go ahead and pass these people. Now, one big thing, there's a good head check. But one big thing I see right here is that we have the sun in our eyes. Um, that's not going to play a role when it comes to us not seeing the vehicle because it's a wide open road. All these different things is perfectly fine. But remember, we have the driver have this same thing in their eyes. And even if they check the mirrors and everything, it's just going to be blinding. So we're going to have a big issue when it comes to time of day. So let's focus on that. So we're going to move forward just a little bit. 
And now we have brake lights. As soon as you see brake lights, that should really distract you. And it's distractions in a good way. I talk about how speed can be a problem, but speed can also be a, a good thing. Too much speed in a corner is a problem. The right amount of speed in the corner is, is a good thing. So speed itself is not a problem. So just like speed, a distraction can be a good thing or a bad thing. A distraction when it's bad is when you target fixate on it. So when you look at it and stare at it and you're focused on that and not focused on your path of travel, that's a big deal. But a distraction in terms of, I see brake lights, I'm gonna look real quick, what are they doing? And I'm gonna keep focusing on this, but I'm gonna keep an eye on these people. That's a good distraction. So when things pop out from your peripheral, make sure you do a quick look at them. Your head should always be on a swivel, your eyes should always be rotating, moving around, looking at different hazards, evaluating if they're a hazard, and then if you have to execute anything, then you have that uh, perception time already taken care of, your reaction time is getting ready to do something, and now you can do an evasive maneuver. So the fact that he sees this, uh, the brake lights, and now we have uh, the car moving over the lines, that's really important for us to pick out. Now he's accelerating to pass the vehicle. So at this point, what you can do since you're accelerating, you can go ahead and decelerate. Go ahead and engine brake, roll off the throttle, it's gonna engine brake and then reach for that front brake and reach for that rear brake and start applying them in a progressive fashion. So remember, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, you wanna squeeze it, not necessarily that slow, but you don't wanna go from five to zero. You wanna go five, four, three, two, one, five, four, three, two, one. You can do it slowly, you can do it faster, but you need to hit every single step on the way down. But that's gonna be enough for you to slow down so this vehicle can go ahead and move all the way over. I don't care why they did it, I don't care how they did it, the, the car specifically, it doesn't matter. They are a landmine and I'm my job is to get away from that. It's very important that I stay away from that and I'm just constantly keeping some type of space cushion or a bubble around me. You ever seen those people on the subway with, it's a funny thing, they have it, it's like, it's like almost like a tutu, but it's like, they're your personal space bubble thing. Treat this as your personal space bubble thing. You're on the road, you need to be away from people. And that's our main job as motorcyclists. We tend to get too close to uh, other people or we get close enough to where at that speed, we start to panic. And that's uh, something that can easily happen. Now, this is gonna be an accident involving him actually colliding with the vehicle. I talk about this all the time in my live streams when it comes to motor vehicle accidents that involve a motorcycle and another vehicle. Two thirds of those are the motorcyclists trying their best to avoid the accident and causing themselves to have basically a solo crash. The other vehicle is still kind of involved, but two thirds of it is based on the fact that the uh, motorcycle rider had improper swerving or impo improper braking. In this situation, it's part of that one third where the crash, the, the actual collision causes the crash itself. So this is gonna be a side swiping issue um, when it comes to the driver hitting uh, Snowcat. So that's gonna be an issue where we need to see what's happening beforehand, like I talked about with the brake lights, with the slowing down, with the pacing, with him having to, or uh, and I'm talking about the Honda here, having to figure out where am I going. We need to figure out people and how they do things here. So looking at rider behavior, looking at driver behavior, all these different things play a huge role in how safe we can be. A lot of things that are discussed in motorcycle safety is how to react to dangers. My biggest thing is how to predict the danger. Therefore, we have an idea of what could possibly happen and we're prepared for it. I don't like reacting. I like to be proactive in this situation. So Snowcat, uh, he got hit, he got injured, and there's obviously the link in the description for all of this, and he's uh, recovered since this accident. But I would love to get an interview with him just so I can figure out, you know, what the physical cost of the bike and his body, like the actual cost, the uh, the financial cost when it comes to, you know, hospital bills, how to replace it with all the insurance, and then the mental cost with, you know, how is he getting back on the bike? How does this make him feel? Is he more wary? Is he, is he more experienced in this way? I would love to, to know that. And if you're in a crash or a close call, I would love to ask you those same questions. But with that said, I hope you guys ride safe, be safe, and thank you Snowcat for posting this online so we can all learn from it. Don't yank, squeeze it in, and pull. Think of an orange in your hand. Go ahead and grab an orange if you have one, whatever. I want you to grab it and squeeze slowly to get that juice out. You don't just yank it and smash it, right? Same thing with the brakes. Pull it in slowly, squeeze it slowly.